Again, my name is Anila, uh, and I want to share a little bit about my own background, further details, just to start us in, in this conversation, uh, because this is a pretty difficult topic uh, for a lot of folks, because this is one of the myths that's used by the anti-Muslim hate groups uh, to promote dehumanization of Muslims in our country. So I was actually born to Muslim parents, you may have heard this last week, uh, and I was raised with certain Islamic values like honesty, service, justice, uh, and hard work, but I was really a Ramadan Muslim. You know, practicing my faith during the month of Ramadan and not really beyond that, kind of like Easter Christians or uh, Christmas Christians as well. I was so fortunate to be the first in my family to get to go to college and get a degree. And it was in college that I actually chose Islam for myself. But as I tell people, I chose it at that time just with my mind, and it didn't really change my behavior in any way. I continued on to law school, which was just beyond my dreams even, but it wasn't until after making partner at a law firm and then working as general counsel of a healthcare IT company that I actually had my spiritual transformation. And that's when Islam really changed my heart and inspired me to make significant change in my life. Those changes included leaving my legal career with nothing but sort of faith and trust in God and hoping everything's gonna work out in order to pursue service and knowledge, two things that are just so important in Islam. And my desire was to pursue my passions, to live out my true purpose in life, and to find peace of mind, spirit, and heart. In fact, Islam comes from the root word for peace, and it means submission to God. The idea is that by submitting our will to God, doing the good that God wants us to do, that we actually achieve peace, both internally within ourselves and with the environment and people around us. Muslims believe all the prophets, including Noah, Abraham, Moses, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, that they were Muslim, at least with a lowercase m, because they submitted their will to God. And some are actually surprised to hear that Muslims believe in these prophets and all the other prophets that are mentioned in the Bible. The Muslim greeting, assalamu alaikum, means peace be upon you or peace be with you as we hear in the Christian tradition as well. And Muslims close every single prayer, which Muslims are required to do five times a day if they're following the faith, by sending salams or peace to everyone on our right and everyone on our left. So as I was learning more about Islam and practicing the five daily prayers, I personally was finding peace. I was becoming a better person. And it wasn't just me. I saw this in my family as well. It was a beautiful change that we were experiencing in our daily lives. We were becoming softer, gentler, more patient and kinder people. But our lived experience and the actual teachings of Islam that we were learning and reading about contrasted significantly to the narrative about Islam and Muslims in media, in politics, and in popular culture. That's why for the past seven years, I've been working on addressing this huge divide that exists on building bridges and getting to know each other and following the sacred teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, and others about loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And I'll be honest and say that without my spiritual transformation, I actually would not have the strength, the spiritual strength to do some of the work that I do. It's actually my faith that teaches me to act humbly and respond with words of peace, even to those who may drive by and yell obscenities at me. It's actually my faith that teaches me to ignore the haters and not let them make me swerve from doing what's right and just. It's my faith that teaches me to show mercy and kindness on earth, even when people may not deserve it, because I want God to show me mercy. And, and I say all of this to help show some of the teachings of Islam, again, not to proselytize, but to show why it was so different from what I was seeing and hearing in media. And believe me, I've been tested on these teachings, as I know others have as well with their religious teachings. I, I remember one example in particular, and I just mentioned this last week, was at an anti-Muslim hate rally when people were coming at me with literal anti-Muslim messages, and I still was able to talk to them and help connect on a human level 
because that's what my faith teaches me. And I see this sort of all the time in the work that I do, the huge divide between what Islam teaches versus what people wrongly think that Islam teaches. For example, in Islam, there is an emphasis on kindness as a mark of faith, on service and bringing benefit to humanity, that the best of people are those who bring benefit to society, to the rest of humanity on doing good, seeking justice, spreading peace, and so much more. And these are similar to the teachings of Christianity and other faith and wisdom traditions. Any of the world's great religions are intended to make us better human beings. But there is an intentional misinformation campaign that promotes a false narrative about Islam and Muslims. This is the industry of anti-Muslim hate groups that Reverend Terry talked about la during last week's webinar. And one of the strongest tools of misconception that they use is to promote false information about Islam and violence. And they do this by taking an Arabic word, jihad, and attributing horrible meanings to it, and then supporting such wrong views with verses from the Quran taken out of context and without proper understanding. So let's talk about this, because we want to directly you know, address the misinformation and the myths. First off, it's important to know that the sanctity of life is significant in Islam, again, just like in other faith traditions. The Quran specifically has a verse talking about how taking one life unjustly is like taking all life, and how saving one life is like saving all of humanity. Moreover, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught that a Muslim is one from, from whom people are safe, physically and even verbally. So then what about jihad? Well, jihad means to strive, to struggle, to exert effort. It is in fact a struggle to do good. And Prophet Muhammad taught that the greatest jihad is to battle our own soul, to fight the evil inclinations and desires within ourselves. This is the major jihad. And it has both an individual and societal component. Individually, it includes overcoming our own ego or laziness, refraining from doing wrong, restraining our anger, praying five times a day, fasting during Ramadan, showing kindness to our parents, and actually not even saying oof to our parents. That's literally in the Quran. And I tell you, that's a, that's a challenge at times. Societally, it includes things like speaking truth to power, struggling uh, for justice, serving those in need, creating the positive change that we want to see, and so much more. And this is all part of the major jihad that every single Muslim, indeed every single person, has to struggle with in this world. Then there's what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself identified as the minor jihad, which is physical confrontation. It is the struggle in the battlefield for self-defense or to fight against tyranny and oppression. It is not supposed to be aggressive action. This minor jihad recognizes that there's a role for protection at times when a person needs to protect themselves or others from harm or oppression, or when a nation needs to protect its citizens. In such cases of protection, the use of force may be justified. And in fact, here in our country, this is why we have over 10,000 American Muslims who have served our country in the, in the interest of protection and defense. But this kind of use of force or physical struggle, the minor jihad in Islam, it's only permissible in limited circumstances with certain specific boundaries. The verses in the Quran that speak about fighting and war are in this limited defensive context. Unfortunately, specific verses are often taken out of context, either by critics or haters of Islam who are discussing jihad, or even by misguided Muslims themselves who wish to justify their aggressive, vile behavior or tactics. For example, verse 190 in chapter two of the Quran, and this is something that is often quoted by folks, the fight in the cause of God. It's portrayed as a command to fight in Islam. <clears throat> but if you read the full verse, you actually get a different picture. It specifically says, those who fight you, but do not transgress for God loves not transgressors. 
This whole passage, if you understand the context and history, is about fighting in defense against the warring Meccan tribes, the Quraysh, who were perpetrators of religious persecution and even torture. And the passage clearly prohibits fighting against those who are not fighting. So it's so important for us to read these verses, religious scripture in general, in context. This is true for the Quran just as much as it's true for the Bible because context matters. Another common misquoted verse in the Quran is the so-called kill them where you find them verse that you often hear people mention. And to properly address that, we need some historical context. Muslims and Muhammad per, uh, were persecuted by the Quraysh. They were harassed and tortured even for 13 years while they were in Mecca. So there were several assassination attempts on the life of Muhammad and still they didn't have permission from God to even sort of fight in self-defense. The Muslims were driven out of their homes. They fled persecution by going to Medina where the, the city invited Prophet Muhammad to join them there. They were welcomed there. But the Quraysh, they seized the property of the Muslims from Mecca. They stole sort of, uh, that's the, uh, they sold those stolen goods that they seized. Finally, in the second year in Medina, sort of 15 years into revelation coming to, to Muhammad, Muslims were finally granted permission to fight their oppressors. That's when they had the Battle of Badr, where 313 Muslims defeated an army of 1,000 soldiers from the Quraysh. And after that battle, there were other battles before the Muslims finally were able to enter into a 10-year peace treaty with the Quraysh in the year 628. And that treaty actually allowed Islam to grow peacefully but the Quraysh, again, they violated that treaty two years later. But by this time, the Muslim community had grown to about 100,000, and they marched to Mecca when the Quraysh violated their treaty. They were able to conquer Mecca, mostly peacefully. And during this time, during this conquest of Mecca, Muhammad was humble. He had his head down, praying to God as he's coming into the city, and even as sort of as a conqueror, which is not the usual image we have of conquerors. And he actually said to the Quraysh, though the same people who had killed and tortured not only his followers, but even his own family members. He said to them something so powerful. He actually repeated the, the, the words that, that we're, we're told Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, said to his brothers in forgiving them for what they did to him. He said, have no fear this day. Go your way. You are all free. And in that context, revelation came, came down saying that these criminals, these enemies who fought you all this time, give them four months to think about the faith. Allow them to be in safety so they are not intimidated in any way or forced in any way. And if they choose to accept Islam, accept them as your brothers and sisters and their equal citizens. If they choose to leave, they can do so peacefully. Make sure they're allowed to leave if they choose to do that. But if they choose to remain in Mecca and they continue fighting you, then the verse says, kill them where you find them. This is not at all a sort of general policy or something that applies beyond the specific instance there where we're told the messenger of God was present, where a four month amnesty was applied and God, we believe, brought an end to the war between the Muslims and the Quraysh. So without this kind of context, you can manipulate religious texts to support sort of anything you want and justify some of the even harmful behavior that people, including some Muslims, unfortunately engage in. And if you want more information about this, there are a couple sources here on the screen that talk more about how various verses from the Quran are misquoted and abused. And you can, there's a video as well that, that goes into uh, more detail on this. So the verses that allow for physical combat, they're very conditional allowance in certain limited circumstances to defend against aggression or oppression. And even where fighting was allowed or is allowed in Islam, it comes with very strict limitations. Here are just some of the kinds of limitations that are supposed to apply. And more, more importantly than that, there's always an emphasis on peace, on seeking peace. This is something that Islam strongly encourages and we have various verses in the Quran that support this as well. That if the enemy, if those fighting you essentially offer peace, then you don't have any cause to continue fighting against people like, you know, who are not fighting you. 
And also, oops, if they incline to peace, then also you're supposed to pursue peace. The mandate to fight was during a time of desperate struggle for survival that the Muslim community was subjected to by its enemies. And when that danger was over, when Muhammad was in a position of power and he could do as he pleased, he actually forgave even his enemies and let them go. And when you think about the kinds of people he forgave, they included Hind, who had literally ordered the assassination of Muhammad's uncle. And not only did she do that, she even literally went on the battlefield and cannibalized Muhammad's uncle, just to show sort of the, the kind of vile hatred that she had to, towards Muhammad. But that the, the behavior of Muhammad in response to even forgiving people like Hind actually reveals the true essence of Islam. And it's what Muhammad actually taught his followers, that you're supposed to show forgiveness and kindness even to those who do you wrong. Now, of course, not all Muslims follow the example of Muhammad or the teachings of Islam, just like not all Christians follow what Jesus uh, taught. But there are many Muslims who do. And, and these stories of forgiveness and kindness are oftentimes the ones that are missing from media, but they are so powerful. Like Rukhaya, who forgave the, the man who killed her son and even hugged him and his mother at the court hearing based on Islamic values of kindness and forgiveness and mercy. I personally know Muslims who have experienced hate-based violence themselves or their family members, but still responded in what is actually a truly Islamic way. Somebody who works with me had her grandfather literally killed with a shovel in, as a hate-based violence in Portland, Oregon. And the family chose not to pursue sort of uh, further charges and then really show the kind of love and forgiveness that's needed. There is somebody who's in, in our sort of Seattle area uh, race Bouillon, who's considered uh, sort of the face of forgiveness because he was shot in the face. And not only did he forgive his shooter, but he actually fought so that his shooter would not uh, receive the death penalty. Now, I'm not saying that we all have to have that level of just incredible spirit, nor is that always sort of, you know, what, what's expected uh, when, when we face uh, sort of this kind of direct harm to ourselves or our family members, our loved ones. I don't know if I would have that kind of strength in all honesty. But there are these stories out there. Um, and I've, again, I personally know people who've been transformed, uh, including people who were formerly anti-Muslim sort of haters who were transformed by the love and the kindness and the mercy they saw and, and experienced from actual Muslims, like Richard McKinney, like Ted Hakey Jr. Uh, and others that we can go into their stories as well. But despite the reality of so many individuals that have lived out Islamic values, those are not the stories or, uh, or narratives that dominate. Instead, there has been a consistent demonizing of Muslims and Islam through media, Hollywood, pop culture, talk shows, and more that present Islam and Muslims as a specific threat. In fact, according to research from Media Tenor, Islam is the most often mentioned religion in mainstream media, and 80% of that coverage is negative and even defamatory. And another study that analyzed the New York Times found that over 25 years, the New York Times portrayed Islam and Muslims more negatively than cancer and cocaine. And with, with, with this kind of coverage, fanatic fringes who may appear in shows like Homeland or 24 or on Fox News, they become the norm instead of everyday Muslims like me or the 3 million other American Muslims in our country. And contrary to the media's narrative, American Muslims, in fact, reject violence more than other Americans, or at least equal to, according to research from the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, both uh, civilian attacks by the military and, yeah, both civilian attacks, and then also attacks by individuals or groups. And when it comes to actual threats in our country, you heard it from Reverend Terry, you heard it in the video, uh, and I, I, I think we've seen report after report about this, that the biggest security threat in our country, on our land, is actually not from people who look like me, or like my brother, or my father, but more often people who look like this. Even though statistically, the majority of mass violence in our country is in fact committed 
by white men, most people don't fear white men as a group, nor should we. I want to be clear about that. According to the FBI, 94% of terror attacks on American soil between 1980 and 2005 were committed by non-Muslims. That's some of the most long-term data available from the FBI. More recently from that, there was an investigative report in 2017 that found that uh, most violent extremism in the US comes from sort of the uh, extremist, uh, uh, white, white uh, extremists. And we compromise security in our nation when we focus so much on Islam. That report confirmed prior reports and statistics and other ones since then, including the Department of Homeland Security, once again, sort of reminding us even this past year in their report that white supremacists remain the biggest source of lethal threat to our country. But the facts and the stats, they don't change hearts and minds. People still have stereotypes of Muslims and other people of color in a way that they do not have about our white brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not saying that all Muslims are good. There definitely are those who, who are sort of, who commit violence or do other wrong. I and Muslims around the world have repeatedly, consistently, and categorically condemned violence by such individuals or groups. And it sickens me when such murderers or criminals seek to justify their behavior, their vile actions with religion. But the mainstream narrative is written in a way to make certain groups appear to be a bigger threat, a greater threat than they are. And this is why some people get labeled the T word, terrorist, with the associated group blame. And others who engage in similar action are often described simply as lone wolves with mental problems or troubled kids, like Dylan Roof, the white supremacists who took the lives of nine African-Americans in a church in Charleston, or Stephen Paddock, who, who uh, took the lives of 58 in Las Vegas, or Nicholas Cruz of the Florida massacre. None of them were labeled the T word, despite their terrorizing actions. And these are for the cases that, we actually, that actually get media attention. There are many others that are not even covered in the news. Media bias shows up both in whether stories are covered and how they're covered, depending on if the perpetrator or victims are Muslim. And in fact, there's a study from ISPU, again, that uh, really talks about this. And I'm going to try to play this video if I can. Have you ever felt like some new stories receive a lot more coverage than others of equal importance? You're not imagining it. For example, in 2010, Justin Carl Moose, a self-described Christian counterpart to Osama bin Laden, planned to blow up an abortion clinic. He possessed all the means to make his own explosives, but was exposed by the FBI before actually carrying out his plot. Never heard of Moose? Perhaps that's because his case received little media coverage. Neither the New York Times nor the Washington Post ran a single story about him. For his alleged crime, Moose was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Compare that case to Antonio Martinez. He was alleged to have acted in the name of Islam when he planned to bomb a military recruitment station outside Baltimore and shoot personnel as they fled the scene. Like Moose, Martinez was also arrested before he had the chance to act on his plot. However, unlike Moose, law enforcement provided Martinez with a fake bomb. Martinez received significantly more media attention. Combined, the New York Times and Washington Post published 10 articles about him. Martinez was charged with planning to use a weapon of mass destruction and was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. This is not an isolated incident. ISPU's Equal Treatment Report compares the legal and media responses to perpetrators perceived to be Muslim and alleged to be acting in the name of a religious ideology with perpetrators not perceived to be Muslim, allegedly acting in the name of another ideology such as white supremacy. And the differences are striking. Perpetrators perceived to be Muslim received four times the sentencing and 770% more media coverage and they were seven times more likely to have the weapons supplied by law enforcement than their non-Muslim counterparts. 
These kinds of disparities misinform the public, fuel suspicion and prejudice, and make us all less safe. Equal conduct should receive equal treatment. Check out all of ISPU's findings in our report, Equal Treatment, Measuring the Legal and Media Responses to Ideologically Motivated Violence in the United States at www.ispu.org. So this kind of sort of double standards that we see contributes to people's perceptions of sort of who are the threats in our country. And a clear result of this kind of narrative problem is the Washington Times media headline uh, reporting on a study. This media, uh, this uh, article is reporting on a study that came out of Duke and the University of North Carolina. And that study, like others, found that the majority of fatalities in terms of domestic terrorism were at the hands of white national extremists. But the headline of this article read, majority of fatal attacks on US soil carried out by white supremacists, not terrorists. Let that sink in. It's almost by definition, we've reserved that T word for a specific group. And that's why it's even used as an anti-Muslim slur. And I have to say, friends, we ourselves, we're able to differentiate one violent Christian criminal from the religion because we know enough about Christianity and Christians to not fear all of Christianity or all Christians when one does something bad. Imagine instead if all we heard about Christianity were the Dylan Roofs or the KKKs of the world. And imagine if we combined that with certain violent verses of the, of the Bible taken out of context, like Luke 19, 27, where Jesus is quoted as saying, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Or Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have, come to, uh, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. That gives you a sense of what's happening with the Quran, Muslims, and Islam in our country. And now just to clarify, I know that that out of context quote from Luke 19, 27, for instance, is from a parable. And I know that Jesus, peace be upon him, did not teach hate or killing. He taught and embodied love. And he said that the greatest commandments are loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Muslims believe in these love teachings of Jesus, and they were similar to the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him as well, about how you can't have faith without loving each other. And I also know that Christianity does not teach hate or killing, despite many examples of people who may hate or may have killed in the name of Christianity, because I've learned Christianity from Christians, not anti-Christians. Unfortunately, most of our fellow Americans have learned Islam not from Muslims, but anti-Muslims. And that's the problem, especially when there is this well-funded infrastructure that promotes and profits off this campaign of misinformation and manipulation. And this, is, this anti-Muslim industry continues that same narrative of fear, scapegoating, and otherization used against other communities, other minority communities as well. As I said last week, the narrative and the script, they're similar. All you got to do is change the characters and the labels. And that's how the, the, the word terrorist gets used the same way that, that the word, you know, another T word, thug, has been used in a different script to, again, demonize, criminalize, and terrorize entire communities. And it's a tool that is weaponized and used as, as a way to divide we the people. But these tools of oppression, they only work if we allow them to. And we actually have a choice and the power to prevent this kind of manipulation, misinformation, and fear mongering. And that's what our whole Facts Over Fear campaign is about. Because regardless of our faith or no faith backgrounds, we have more in common with each other than any of us might with fringe elements of our own faith or wisdom traditions, or those haters who seek to destroy or hurt others. And we should be uniting and standing against all harm and violence, recognizing how much our safety, our security, our well being are directly connected. And as I said last week, together we can promote a different narrative from the one by the anti Muslim industry that, in fact, hurts all of us as Americans. We can promote facts over fear. We can choose love over hate and commit to our pledge of one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much.